Hello, uh, I'm Chris. Thank you, Jens, for the introduction. And welcome to, uh, to a session about named tuples, a potential C20 improvement over STD tuples. So I hope you will enjoy that one. Uh, this session is um, uh, about the dream, which I've been having for a while. And you know, one night I just woke up and tried to implement uh, it and make it happen. So it, this session also will explain why we cannot have, you know, awesome things yet in C20, but it will. Chris, when we unlock an achievement. So, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, let's begin. And yeah, everything is powered by the Compiler Explorer. Links will be provided and everything is uh, C20 uh, standard compliant and might be checked online. If you don't mind, I will try to take the questions at the end, but don't, uh, feel free to uh, ask them at any time. Just put a slide number if you can see it on the right bottom corner so that I can refer to that. So what's the motivation? So name tuples are coming from Python. Python is actually using them very often. And the reason why they introduced that is mainly because um, the name tuples in Python requires indexing it by a number. So you know, like in C++, we have as to the get, zero, one, or by type. Uh, if, if possible. In Python, there's the same case, uh, tuples have to be accessed by the index. So that's why they introduced name tuples. And, you know, I was talking about this dream, I was thinking about what's wrong with our tuples uh, and how we can improve them. And one of the things which we definitely would like to have is the names because the names of, uh, of fields make the whole chain, uh, you know, are the game changer. So what, what are the main issues with the STD tuples? When we create the STD tuple uh, like that, so far no issues. When we try to get it by type, however, uh, that ain't gonna work because the type is ambiguous in that case. So X and Y are both ints and the tuple is created from both uh, two ints. So when we try to get it, it will be ambiguous type and we'll get hard error. It's not even um, a nice error message as well. So all of that is not great because we would like to get an X and Y potentially. You know, accessing by, by the type is good if you have a strong types, which I encourage everyone to use, but sometimes you just don't have this ability when you're using third party libraries or anything like that, which doesn't provide you the strong types and unique types in, in that map. Also, when we're accessing it by the value, we have the same case as in Python. Get zero and get one, that's fine. However, if you put the y and x in the wrong order, well, we won't get what we actually wanted. What we really want to write is, I want an x, I want the y, like in a strap. The same with structure bindings, which is C17 addition. Which is awesome, right? Because we can destructure the tuple into two elements. However, we still have to maintain the X and Y. So we can imagine that it started from X and Y, and you know, someone changed it in the future, and then you know, all the code breaks again. So that's big issues which I'm seeing with the STD tuples, and uh, which we have so far. There are obviously other issues, like get two. In that case, when we have two elements. Which we, when we try to access the third one, will give us a not SPINA friendly error. So we cannot do substitution failure is not an error. Uh, what I mean by SPINA is the fact that we cannot do really a TMP with STD tuples because we always get a hard error and hard errors will just break uh, and, and won't be discarded by the compiler. What is a huge benefit of potential tuple implementations of the structs because structs are 
Also, I'm going to we'll take a look into subtyping versus it's called drop polymorphism. We will discover the STD tuples and name tuples, actually, and other use the STD tuples. Is the fact that STD tuple could be actually packed properly. So if you have uh, here T1, which is uh, of it, uh, which has types of int, short, and char, the size of it will be eight bytes because they packed in an order, right? So int and short and char, it's four, two, and one on x86 uh, architecture. However, if you put them in a different order, and notice here it's like we didn't change the type, we just changed the order, then immediately the size become 12 because of the alignment. So you can imagine that how awesome would that be would that would be if the tuple itself could pack it for us with the policy. For example, you say tuple, I want the packed uh, size because I do care about performance, for example, a memory layout, or I don't and I would be able to switch that uh, accordingly. However, STD tuple doesn't, doesn't provide that, uh, this feature, which is a bummer. So I was saying about this dream, it's like, I don't know how many uh, of you have, you know, coding dreams. I'm, I'm one of those people who sometimes dream, sometimes dream about coding, and then I wake up in the, you know, at 2 a.m. and try to implement those things. So one night I actually gone uh, and tried to implement the STD tuple improvement in C plus plus twenty. So what? And so what was the dream about? That's what I would like to write. I would like to write a tuple which has x and y and access it by name. T dot x, t dot y. I would really like that, and that would give. Uh, you know, really handy interface towards tuples. And there's no mistakes here. If I, you know, get zero, get one, there's nothing like that. We access it by name, we produce it by name, we initialize it by name. I like it. If you call Z or Z, it cannot be found the name tuple, and that would be a constraint not satisfied in my in my dream. Sometimes dreaming on concepts too. If I want the type of it, I would just do deco type of that tuple, and then I can initialize it uh, with the names. And the order doesn't matter because both of them are unique types because they are named. So we just initialize things by name. So the order doesn't matter. We can initialize X, Y, or Y, X, which has some benefits in some cases. Yeah, that's one of the main use cases. I would like to print the tuple, right? You can do that somehow in C20 or 17 with the structure bindings and kind of like magic get approach. But the problem is that you can't get the names of variables. Uh, we can only get the types and pick those. Uh, without static reflection, we cannot do anything about it at the moment uh, unless we use name tuples or similar approach. To print it, I would like you to print X and Y. And and that would be awesome. That would be awesome in all the, those cases, I believe. Yeah, I also would like to based on JSON it. So for example, I would like to implement it. In a, I would like to implement a two JSON function, uh, which takes a tuple and just produce a JSON out of it. You know, simple static reflection use cases. There are obviously tons of other dreams uh, one can imagine. For example, a std vector of, of t, and we can query a database using those names. And you can imagine here that select x and y are compile time strings, which will be accessed from the tuple because the tuple has the names as well associated to the field members. So that opens up so many potential uh, features to do with, you know, when you think about static reflection, all of them will be enabled by that. And that obviously will uh, query the result. So, you know, talking about concepts, having it SFINA friendly would be great as well. So that's artificial syntax in which we could do requires on TX that will actually work uh, in C++ uh, 20. But let's imagine that we have the X and Y accessible from the tuple 
X and Y would pass the requirement and Z wouldn't. We can easily, you know, spin either way if you want to with concept. Also, it, uh, the idea that we would be able to conceptify it uh, with the raw polymorphism, which we will discuss later, by saying that this um, um, tuple requires, or it's like if you're familiar with um, extensible Haskell project uh, or JavaScript uh, extensible um, uh, approaches, you'd notice that it's very similar, that you have a concept in which you say what kind of names have to be in it. And then you can uh, query those by, by names because you know that all of them will be satisfied. So on the first line, X and Y names are part of the tuple, but on the second one, X and Z are not because only X is there and Z is not. Yeah, my dream was uh, also about this packing. I would really like to have uh, eight in both sizes, in both uh, cases. So T1 and T2 would be packed accordingly to what is uh, like the most efficiently as possible. So that would be great to have. And last but not least, modify and access it by name. It's always something which uh, would be would be great to have, as well as being able to easily extend a tuple with another tuple. So that's like uh, modeling inheritance. So we have a tuple T, uh, and then we extend it with uh, Z equals 10, and we get to a new tuple, which is T2, which, which has X, Y, and Z. So that's also really nice to have. So that's the goal. The goal is to make the dream come true, to make the name tuples uh, in C++ 20. So let's take a look what we can do. The goal versus the reality. That's not the solution, but that's what we potentially could do. You know, exploring the potential solution space. If you have static reflection, yes, please. We would be able to simply do that with the structs and get an X and Y and types as well. Uh, no issues here. Uh, there are some problems with um, creating a struct with like return type um, uh, with the return statement because you cannot like introduce them in place. Um, but you could you kind of you know deal with it in, in most cases. So static reflection would, would help us a lot and probably name tuple wouldn't be as important as they are in C++ 20, but static reflection is not coming anytime soon. So we'll see. Additional approach would be to create a named tuple and put a name into a, a type instead of the variable, well, with the variable as well, so that we can have this access by X or Y. But that requires duplications and also the conversions because we have different type when we have an int uh, that's always uh, difficult be it for uh, integral types because we cannot inherit from them. So we have to, you know, kind of manipulate a strong type. So that's not super simple, but it's doable. Mm. However, it requires, it's not dry. Don't repeat yourself and we do repeat ourselves all the time and we need to require the implicit conversions uh, to, to support um, the types. Additionally, if you've been at CPCon, uh, there was a talk about Metastruct, which is very similar to the second approach. It's kind of a combination of both, but uh, we avoid this duplication by, by having a Metastruct, which has a member field, uh, member types field. Uh, it still requires annotating, still requires conversion, but uh, and this is more dry. So that's uh, the solution space which we could go about. There's one more option, and that will be the name tuple. What about if you use the C20 features in order to implement a name tuple with, with those? So you can imagine that we create a name tuple, and here we'll, we'll take a look what's underscore T. 
uh, later on. So just keep that in mind. We have an x which is equals four and y which is equals two. Uh, the types are being deduced. So x will be an int, y will be an int, the name will be x and y, and we'll have a name tuple. So if we uh, decal type uh, a name tuple, which is constructed this way, which is four and two as an int, we'll get a kind of this meta struct tuple, which will have an arc of x and int and y of int. So you can imagine here that it's basically a boilerplate uh, removal of writing this record T, which you also can write. You can write name tuple with angle brackets, but if you want to avoid angle brackets and use a designated initializer with underscore T, uh, I think that that's nicer. And then we can uh, in initialize it with uh, our designated initializer kind of approach. And the order doesn't matter um, as before because we have unique types because the types are arc of x int and arc of y and int. We can access by name. So here you notice this um, accessing it from the in index uh, square bucket operator kind of uh, thing with the name. Uh, and that allows us actually to improve much over the uh, the tuple because tuple requires dot get uh, std get uh, to be part of it. And why it's not part of the tuple itself? It's because uh, in the uh, dependent context you would have to put template on it. So you'd have t dot template get in some cases. In some cases we wouldn't require that depending on how. Uh, how you access it, uh, where you are. And in that case, when you have the square bracket operator, we always uh, are not required to do the template. So, so it's nice uh, and we can access it by name. And name is a you know, compile time string here. When we get the Z, we'll, get, uh, we'll try to get the Z. We'll get a nice compile time error that the constraint is not satisfied from the concepts. It's obviously printable and uh, because that's the case. You can use also put a name on the tuple itself. So not to see X and Y and we say, oh, that's a point. That's a point and then we can access all the things by the field, uh, by the names and print it as well. Additionally, we can actually also adapt and name to the extract. So we have a point X and Y, and we would like to just put the names on it. So we've been basically dry, we can do that. Notice the only difference is here that instead of quotes for the point, which you know kind of creates an anonymous tuple struct kind of thing, we do uh, uh, at a type, which is the point, and we still initialize it with X and Y, and that will fail in case they won't match as with the Zagnite initializers. And when we compare them, we can access them by the uh, names. We can also uh, access them by, uh, by the names with the string involved too. And when we print it, uh, we'll get the same result. Notice that we get the point as well being printed. So all of that is uh, uh, Pretty handy for especially all the use cases which we discovered. So I think uh, that's pretty cool. Obviously, we can do the JSON as well. Uh, there's nothing stopping us because we have all the names and fields available. We can do the get zero and one because it's a tuple. So name tuple, you know, kind of builds on std tuple. So we would like to have the compatibility between those types. So we can do that and we'll take a look how difficult it is to implement structure branding for your custom types. Uh, so that will work, but the issue will remain if you mistaken it. So you, the structure branding is probably not desired unless kind of in unsafe mode uh, with the name tuples. We can modify it by name. This you know, overloads and the const overload and non console overload. So there's not been uh, really stopping us uh, from using that. The only difference is that we have to access it by this 
uh, UDL uh, user defined litter instead of X and Y, which would be perfect. But unfortunately, we cannot do that unless we will adopt a struct. We can extend it uh, as in our you know perfect example. We can put a T and a Z and um, and just T will be extended by by Z. We will get a new tuple which has everything from T and also the Z. Uh, concept also would work uh, because we will just spin it away. Uh, so here is actually working code in which you can verify that the concept is satisfied. You have to propagate it through the Lambda in order to not to get a hard error, but that's the way you can easily uh, verify that concepts are satisfied. And we can also do this uh, raw polymorphism extends, uh, this is basically the same as the dream. So regarding that, uh, there's a huge difference between, well, maybe not a huge difference, but there's a difference between subtyping uh, and raw polymorphism. Raw polymorphism is a kind of polymorphism that allows to write programs that are, that are polymorphic on the record few types, which are the rows. It is very popular in, you know, uh, languages which don't have tracks and are more like scripting languages. But you can imagine here that we have a print which, you know, use this extensible kind of pattern, which we say something which has an X and Y names can be passed into that. In that case, it will be this name tuple. And then we can say X and Y. So we can do that with the concept in C++ Penny uh, as well. But the problem with the concept is that you would have to put a name on them. And here we can just put the names into the extent uh, theme uh, concept. So that's kind of handy because we avoid a lot of boilerplate. And I will, I will print uh, X, Y uh, as expected. And in the second case, the Z will be just uh, dismissed because although it satisfied the concept of X and Y, uh, it's not really printed on the uh, next line. And if you try to access um, a pass the, some, something which doesn't have Y, Mm -hmm. That would just say the concept is not satisfied because extent requires A, X, and Y. So what's the difference between subtyping? Subtyping is something which we use very often in C++. We have a struct, uh, which have fields, and then we extend the real struct. And the problem here is that we have a lot of boilerplate. If you want to uh, do kind of this uh, polymorphies, uh, when we want to print a human, uh, that's fine when we want to I do it with the employee, but what about the fish? If you want to add a fish, like should we extend human? That doesn't make much sense. So then we would have to put additional entity and like a lot of boilerplate just to make it happen. Uh, so subtyping is good, but it also has negatives and also doesn't support the names in our case. So with the name tuples, we can actually do something like uh, height and weight, uh, height and weight uh, as a named parameters, and they will be defaulted to uh, stdna or whatever you want uh, by default. Uh, it's a policy for that. And then the employee, human, uh, uh, will add the salary uh, as we have in uh, the line uh, on the top. But instead of passing a human to the print, we pass a concept which just have to satisfy high, uh, just have to have the names for height and weight. And in, in, in that case, employee will just be printed and fish is just a name tuple, which has both names as well. So I hope that uh, that's appealing. Uh, and finally, uh, we can make it packed as well. So, and you can imagine, uh, because it's not destruct, the field members are not uh, coupled to to the order in any shape or form, because we uh, define the layout whilst, uh, when we put uh, names and values into the tuple. And then the tuple underlying implementation may pick uh, the most optimized layout if you want it via policy. And in that case, 
both them will be properly sorted by the type uh, size of the type and both them will have eight bytes which is which is great for the performance and the code layout in some cases so i'll just take a look quickly uh, if there are any outstanding questions although i said yeah. okay well i don't see any outstanding the super important questions uh, besides that there was an echo in the beginning which i heard as well sorry about that uh, let's take a look into implementation then yeah, yeah. so it, it'll be a uh, implementation you simplify the c plus plus 20 around 100 lines of code and we'll use a few c plus plus 20 concepts which will uh, probably enjoy uh, because they're super fun so if you just want to implement an name tuple uh, uh, which will have the size of one because it will be an empty struct. Uh, we can just do that uh, because std tuple uh, will satisfy our requirement here. So there's nothing really special for that. Uh, and we have you know a bit of domain that we implemented something. What about if you want to support uh, more things uh, like the name? The name is you know a UDL which we I really want to to have a unique type for, and that would be allowed uh, in C plus plus twenty. We could have done it in previous, um, not really a previous standard, but the compilers which are accessible right now, besides except uh, Visual Studio. However, it required us to use a GNU extension uh, for doing so. So C plus plus twenty is the first standard which allows us to get. Uh, uh, UDLs for unique types of strings and pass them around as well with NTTP. So thank you for that, C++20. So in case uh, here, uh, we can compare, uh, you can see that name T is convertible to string view and will give us the same name and also the types will be different. So that's the main part which is important because when we try to access it by the index operator, we have to get to a different name and a different type because otherwise uh, you know having a I, let's say string view uh, wouldn't help us because there'll be ambiguous type like in case of the tuples so in order to do so in c20 the first approach we could take uh, a kind of in c17 as well would be just to put auto and and try to put the string into it however uh, we cannot do that uh, because we will get an error message, which is kind of leading us into, oh, we can actually put the string into it, but that's not the case. That's for parsing the numbers, uh, like 42 underscore uh, M, which will be 42 meters or something like that. Then we can just parse it and return a different type if we want. So there is a proposal and that's a blue background, something to Member, uh, which passed uh, and was voted out to C20 from Louis de Young, which notice here uh, the UDL, which is passing instead of auto, a basic fixed string, which is not part of the standard. However, you can imagine that we can uh, pass something which is a non type template parameter. That's what it's called uh, in the standard. Uh, uh, terminology, uh, which means that we can not only pass um, uh, types, we can also pass uh, objects uh, around. And that's how we can create the UDL with the string. So the hello underscore UDL will propagate the, the string into fixed string online, uh, on, on, on the line above, uh, and that's where we can get the name. And the name will be uh, also a unique type. So how to implement this fixed string? Uh, that's a requirement for it. Uh, uh, from our perspective, we just need to have a different type and as well as it has to be convertible to string view so that we can print it. So that's a basic implementation which can be found in the standard uh, of proposals, not in the standard, in the proposals for, uh, for that. It just takes the fixed string. It has a CTAT, uh, uh, deduction guide for the uh, from the char const ref size uh, and notice here that we have a size on it 
and that's why we need this uh, spaceship operator to compare uh, different uh, the, uh, different fixed strings uh, uh, because the mangling will be different. So in the compiler implementation for the fixed string, actually will be fixed string of A, B, C uh, of uh, N, A, M, E in that case. And that's what will be visible. Uh, and the type will be different. But we need this spaceship operator in order to, uh, which is defaulted, which you know enables all those magic, uh, all that magic, and also make the mang mangling possible. So that's the implementation of it. Uh, hopefully, it will be in the next standard, and we'll be able to just leverage it. So, how we implement this operator? Uh, let's put a, a, an arc which we've seen before, which takes just the name. And here, notice that we pass the fixed string into it, and we return something. Which, uh, we, we we support operator for the uh, string view conversion, which takes the the data and the size. And after that, uh, we can just create the UDL, which takes the fixed string and return the name. Let's just notice uh, it should be not arc clone clone data, it should be name clone clone data. Sorry about that. And arc clone uh, name clone clone size. So, what will happen here when we do deco type of X uh, and Y on the bottom? The types will be different because in the compiler representation will be arc of x and arc of y. And that's the implementation detail of the compiler. Uh, it will differ from um, GC to CLA to MSVC. But uh, the main point here is that it will be unique. And also the conversion to string view will also work. So that's great. We have name t. Right now we want to assign it to a value. So uh, the requirements and tests are here that we uh, we do name underscore t equals 42, and then we can get the name and the value. So in order to do that, uh, we'll create the operator UDL underscore t. Let's assume the type will be any for the, you know, uh, usually we would like to have a policy for that or even disallow, uh, you know, random types. But for the simplicity of this example, we just put the STDN on it. Uh, so an arc will have name and value, as we discussed before. And this uh, assign, uh, assignment operator will be overloaded. Uh, yeah, we have to do that. Uh, sorry. Uh, however, it's a handy, uh, handy way of assigning the value, right? So, so in case of the arc, which by default, with the UDL will be instantiated with the name and the T value will be any. Then we overload it with the assignment operator and we'll get a rebinded type which has the name and the new type and we'll assign this value right to it. So right now we have this uh, UDL. Uh, uh, assignment as well, we can then implement named tuple with both X and Y, for example. How do you do that? Well, the simplest way of doing it, it's much simpler than in case of STD tuple, because STD tuple requires to have the, the numbers because we have to, uh, uh, because the types might not be unique. So so if you pass two ints, we cannot just simply inherit from two ints because that would be ambiguous and would be ambiguous base. However, in our case, the types uh, also have a name in it. So they will have to be unique because we don't support the same names twice because that would be, uh, be at least weird. So in that case, we can simply inherit from the uh, TSS which we have. So we have a name tuple. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, again, we have a CTAD, and after that, we can simply inherit from all the types and initialize them. And then we just have to implement uh, index operator for uh, modification and access. So I hope that makes sense. How to do that part? That's uh, an exciting kind of uh, a part of the talk uh, where we try to access the name. 
So in order to do that, let's implement a get with the string, with the tick string. Uh, and then we'll just use it as an underlying implementation. Why we want the get? Uh, uh, it will be described later because that will be uh, required for the structure bindings. So we have this get, uh, which is a very simple implementation of something which takes an arc of the name and t value, and it's just a specialization of uh, of get. So, uh, and we will return the value. So we have an arc. And you can imagine that since we inherited from, sorry, so let me rephrase that because probably that wasn't clear. So since we, the name tuple inherits from all the types, which are arg of name and, and the value, so arg of int and x, arg of y and int, sorry, uh, then if we pass it uh, to the get function, which is like that, if the types, inherited types matches one of them, at least, uh, we'll get to that function call. And that's uh, supported by the just inheritance priorities. And then we can just return the value out of it. And we return it from, uh, not just the parentheses to avoid uh, copying from the error value. So in that case, how the operator square uh, index operator will look like. So we take the T, notice the T doesn't have a value because it doesn't really matter. It's a unique type, which is this fixed string produced by the UDL. Then we have this requires requires to support the concept. Uh, sorry, uh, syntax not great. Uh, we can put a name on that concept and then just avoid one requires. But for the simplicity of the slides, we just put it in uh, directly to, to see that actually uh, uh, concepts are Concept syntax, the long syntax is, is kind of confusing. And you can see here that we get the name and the name is taken from the uh, type which is provided. And we pass uh, this um, reference uh, to it. And that will go back and we'll try to figure out whether we have an overload from the inheritance which will pass uh, that get. And if it does, then we just return the value. That's it, uh, as simple as that. Uh, there's not really magic besides the fact that how C++ works. So in that case, uh, when we have the name tuple, we can easily access it by the, uh, by the name using x underscore t or y underscore t. If you get the z, uh, we try to access the z, name not found, that will be constraint not satisfied from the get uh, uh, function. So we want to get really nice concept error message, uh, but we'll get at least that there's no viable overload because uh, constraint not satisfied. And notice here that's from the clan. The arc has one to two and zero, which is the Z um, name, and the zero is uh, the ending character. Would be nice if it was a string, uh, but did we have that. From GC actually is uh, showing the, the name and uh, the, the character. I don't, MSVC, I don't know what it's doing but it's doing something uh, in that vein as well. So yeah, uh, achievement unlocked, uh, issues still uh, there. Uh, uh, congrats, uh, you passed through the first phase. So what else we have? So which things will just work out of the box? So notice that we have this inheritance. So because we have uh, inheritance, we can actually inherit from a different tuple and create NT1 here and just propagate it to uh, NT2. And all the fields will be propagated because of the inheritance, how the inheritance works. So that will be free. Uh, I like it. Uh, I will take it. If you want to have nested composite tuples, in a sense, like a tuple inside a tuple, we can do it like uh, is in the nested case we put a name on a tuple and that will be inheriting from an arc of nested NT1. And so then we can access it by uh, nested and then the Z and because that will be a tuple inside the tuple. So that will just work out the box because of the inheritance. So we don't have to do anything. Uh, that's, uh, that's quite handy. Also, since we put the concept on it, uh, requires uh, 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 so the 
con uh, the concepts that the constraint uh, we just work out the box because we have the uh, constraint on the on the get function. So x will pass and z will not. We can also very easily implement the concept for the extent, which is this extensible kind of thing with the names. So notice here that we have the t, and after which is the type of the tuple, and after that we propagate the fixed string of names which we want to support. So in our case, that was x, y, and z. And it, in, in that uh, implementation, we just put requires of uh, all the, uh, that all the arcs have to be accessible by the, uh, by the tuple. And we do full expression over that all of them, uh, have, none, none of them cannot uh, fail in a sense. So T of X, T of Y has to, uh, has to be allowed uh, from the tuple, meaning the tuple has to have those names and types involved. And if that's satisfied for all of them, uh, we good. So if you have X and Y in our, you know, simple point tuple, then that's true. X and Z, that's uh, not true because we miss in Y. And this end on the fold expression will just uh, uh, not work. What is not working? Structure bindings, as I pointed out before, structure binding doesn't work out of the box, uh, the custom types. We have to do, do a bit of magic to do so because the error will be that cannot decompose class type name tuple. Also get by numbers doesn't work out of the box because we don't have that overload provided. And we need that overload in order to support structure bindings. So how to make that happen? Unfortunately, there's no really a nice way of doing that because there are no customization points besides opening the namespace STD and provide a tuple size. And that's also for the custom struct. So if you have a custom struct, you have to provide a tuple size and get uh, for those guys. And, and, and we do here in our simple case, we get the size of the name tuple. We have to get the size because if you inherit, we would have to uh, also take the size of the nested tuples into consideration. But for the simple case, let's say it's just the size of TSS, which you just propagate to simple uh, arc equals name. And then we have to implement this uh, template.get, uh, as pointed out before. That's why we have std get, not the member function with the end uh, for the tuple element. So we need those two things in order to support uh, structure bindings. Size is simple. We just go over uh, all the TSS, get the TS size recursively, uh, in a sense, from all of them. Otherwise, we return one, and we just sum that up. And not to see if it's a design by introspection kind of pattern with the immediately invoked lambda. Uh, so if concept requires size, we go to the size. Uh, and that's important because if we don't have um, receive cons expert, that would just uh, fail with hard error. So we need cons expert and requires it's a concept uh, which verifies whether the size is provided, meaning that is a tuple, uh, which is you know nested tuple, or whether that's an arc, which is not a tuple because it doesn't have the size because it has name and value. And if it just has name and value, then it's just one. So then the get itself has to be changed a bit and we'll do a bit of magic with C++ 20 here to immediately invoke lambda expression with index sequence to get the number. Uh, we'll introduce this ID name, which will get, uh, and we'll add an overload for the get. Uh, because here we'll have a name tuple and, and like we had arc, we, we can have ID and name. And notice here that the name will just uh, return for the given number it will just return a name and then we can access it, uh, the name tuple from the name uh, i know that might be a bit confusing uh, but, but yeah uh, uh, that's the simplest way 
to implement it with C plus plus twenty without much uh, boilerplate. So then we, when we have that, get zero and one will just work, as well as um, structure bytes. So great. Uh, and just a small remark about this immediately invoked function expression, in which uh, uh, you can imagine an arrow function which goes over the index sequence and will uh, call the expression. And it, and if you put unknow on the uh, lambda expression, we just put hello world, we'll get assembly, which will just be unknown. So that's a very handy way of doing that in C20 in a one liner. Uh, that can be done in C17 and previous standards. Uh, just requires a bit of more uh, hassle to implement. So in the uh, printing, the tuple, very simple. We just have to provide the uh, C out operator in a sense. And here, since we have a get, we just do apply over the tuple. There's nothing special here uh, because um, it just works out of the box like the normal tuple. And the art will have name and value available to us. So we just print them. Simple. Uh, so if we get point and try to print it, we'll get point every one. Uh, in case of the struct point, we'll have to get the type name of a thing you can imagine like type ID of the, when you try to adapt the struct, type ID of the type, uh, you can do a trick with pretty function to get a, a nice uh, point out of it, but it's uh, not standard because pretty function is not standard. So. Regarding the adapting the struct, that might be more difficult to print uh, across different standards, but uh, at least we can print uh, with the string when we provide the name. So yeah, uh, achievement unlocked. Uh, we're getting closer to what we want, actually. The last thing would be to get the uh, packed name tuple, because currently we'll return eight, uh, return 12 instead of eight for given types because um, they're not sorted in order of size of types. And that will be an exercise for the reader. Uh, there's a tip here. Uh, you can do MP sort of the size of, of arcs. Uh, any submissions are more than welcome. Uh, I have a solution uh, in the full implementation which is provided uh, at the end. But if anyone feels like trying to achieve in that, uh, it's a, it's a fun exercise to do. And the full implementation can be found in this book link. So feel free to, to go and experiment and, and, uh, and do whatever you want with it, uh, basically. So what about the showcase? Uh, as I pointed out before, uh, we would like to do something more uh, usable with the Mm, name tuple so that we'll see why, why we would like to use it. So let's say we have an employee uh, structure uh, which is created as follows with the name tuple and we put a name, age, and title. And here we'll just put the types, uh, specific types of it, and we'll have a vector of those name tuples. So you can imagine that would be a like a struct of string of the name, end of the age, and string of the title. And then that's the type that we produce, the vector of name tuple of arcs, as we described before. So we have a vector of employees. And we just place back. And notice here that we constructed with the designated initializer kind of approach. Uh, so if you try to provide wrong order, order is fine, but wrong names that won't compile. So we're good here, we won't make any mistakes. We have strong types, which some, you know, fuck us up. So we can provide two uh, employees into, into our structure, immediately modify it by taking the first one, taking the age, put a different number, uh, access uh, them by name. Nothing special here, we discovered that. But what is really cool, it's two JSON. 
to JSON on the slides for the next tuple, which would look mainly like that. So we want an array of objects of employees uh, with all the values provided. So the whole implementation to JSON takes the O stream and takes a vector of tuples. Uh, we print the, the array because we know it's a vector. In our simplified case, we iterate the range for loop over, over the, the vector. We print the name of the main thing, which is the, the tuple name, in that case, employee. And after that, we just do apply again, as we did with, um, uh, uh, with the C out example before. We fold express. Uh, we apply full expression over the name, our, our arguments, and print the name and the value. And that's it. Uh, from JSON, that's also available uh, in the example. However, it will be uh, not provided here, and uh, because that will be another exercise for the reader. So that's a difficult, more difficult one. And the idea is that we have the compile time stream, which we, in that case, can uh, since we have the names and everything, uh, we can translate into the name tuple, which is super powerful if it comes to the uh, compute and computing and performance. So just because we just have a few minutes left, uh, let's just do and compare the benchmark of compilation times. Uh, because I think it's also important, like that's one of the main questions why why we would use that if it's you know 10 times slower to compile or something. So the simple benchmark would be just to create a big tuple with I think thousands of elements or hundreds of elements and just access all of them and name people kind of a similar vein just with the names instead. And what, what the result shows? The result shows that um, there's a two thing at least that the name tuple is quite stable if it comes to the compilation times because it doesn't depend on the standard library as std tuple does. So std tuple is much slower to compile with GCC, Libs, and C++ because the uh, intrinsic for um, uh, index sequence is not being used and there's a recursive uh, sort of version there. Uh, Lipsy++ is in the, uh, the, the intrinsic, so it's much faster to compile. So we see that with the clan, uh, std duple and standard C++, it's slower actually, but the fastest possible is a bit faster. But the difference is not huge, so I think that's positive, because that's for one of the elements. Uh, it's not like a second versus a minute, it's, it's maybe 10%. Uh, slower to combine, obviously, that might be improved as well. And we have more features. Uh, for uh, the debugging part of it, because the previous one was the optimized version with all three, this one is with the debug symbols. Uh, basically, very similar results uh, showing that, um, that it is uh, faster to use a 3D tuple to compile. However, the difference is not huge enough not to consider it at least. So to sum up, uh, so we have three minutes left. I, I would argue that Python name tuples are really powerful and flexible. Uh, they definitely a feature which would be really nice to have in C++. However, also adding a feature from scripting language to a system language imposes challenges because we don't want, you know, to use a script and language approach towards it, we have to adjust to, you know, our, our custom uh, performance and other uh, uh, important things which we care about in C++. So C++ 20 definitely simplifies template metaprogramming. However, we pay, in my opinion, a huge cost in complexity by lacking reflection capabilities, all of that would be super simple and super handy if you had reflection available, a static reflection. We would be able to use an instruct and just get the names. And if you had meta classes or something like that, we could even do the packing part of it as well and take one struct, 
create a different struct in this part uh, and has the names. So that would be great, uh, but that may be to come. Uh, for the time being, C++ 20, we can deal with the name tuple uh, as an improvement over ST tuple in my opinion. So yeah, uh, with that, uh, let's name all the tuples uh, in C++ 20. And I will go back to questions. Oh, there's many questions. Uh, there's a comment that uh, GCC Clang already packed tuples. I would argue uh, with that. We can discuss that. Uh, yeah, actually, there's a follow up comment that it doesn't. Uh, uh, English, uh, Yeah, there's no comments about packed. It seems like the packing is uh, quite handy. Uh, but yeah, uh, so by default, the std tuple is not packing. Uh, uh, the, the implementation of std tuple uh, replacement, we, which can do that. However, uh, the std tuple doesn't do that. Mm. There are more comments, um, which I'm actually not asking, uh, saying the questions. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's like I will answer most of them offline, I think, because they we are out of time and I'll just go and, and have to begin into uh, some specific code examples. Uh, but yeah, with that, I think we can uh, finish up on time and I will follow up with the questions. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, and then we're going to end the stream and send the down here.